Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about next-gen consoles. They are supposed to arrive in 2020. PlayStation is obviously getting PlayStation 5 prepped. We've got Microsoft with their next-gen Xbox consoles, both seemingly releasing sometime in fall 2020. And we've already got a few details on the Xbox side of things. Some reports suggest that we're gonna see two versions of that console. And rumors suggest that Microsoft will kind of tease these consoles at E3 2019. And now we're finally seeing Sony make their move. They have teased the first official details for their next generation console. This information was relayed by news outlet Wired. The editor of this article was basically invited by Sony to get exclusive details on what the next-gen PlayStation entails, and it's still very early details, nothing thoroughly specific, but definitely some cool information to glean at. The subject of this article was Mark Cerny, who was the lead architect for PlayStation 4 and is the lead architect for PlayStation 5, and one of the first things he said was that PlayStation 5 will not be out by the end of 2019. He emphasized that you shouldn't expect the console this year, and that is hardly surprising. And it's not a big deal either. I think PlayStation 4 still has a lot of life left in it. There's still a lot of games, exclusive ones at that, that haven't released yet, such as first-party titles like Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima. Days Gone is coming out soon, and of course, Kojima's Death Stranding, which is exclusive to PlayStation 4. That's coming out sometime soon as well. So there is just a lot of stuff for PlayStation 4 that we can look forward to that will sort of ride out the wave towards PlayStation 5. From there, Mark Cerny talked a bit about hardware upgrades for the new console. When it comes to CPU, it will apparently be an AMD chip based on the third generation Ryzen line. The specific details include that it's gonna be eight cores, seven nanometers Zen 2 micro architecture. And these are all terminologies that I'm not super familiar with in terms of their implications, but based on reports, it is apparently pretty powerful. It's a very modern CPU, and it is gonna be powerful enough to support 8K resolution. Now, personally speaking, I think 8K is gonna be overkill. I don't think there are many TVs out there right now that are 8K, and in fact, 4K is still something that's trickling in. Most people still use 1080p TVs and they're perfectly comfortable with that. So I think the focus is gonna be on 4K. 8K just seems unnecessary to me, but I suppose we'll find out how 8K evolves over the course of five years. But the point that Mark Cerny is making here is that it is possible to do 8K should the need arise. And who's to say that when 8K becomes more standardized, they won't do like a mid-generation upgrade, kind of like from PS4 to PS4 Pro. Maybe we'll see a PlayStation 5 Pro that will be much better at doing 8K resolution. Though again, I just don't see the appeal of 8K. I haven't seen an 8K TV up front, Maybe if I see one, I'll be mesmerized by it. But anyway, that's that on the CPU side of things. Next up, we have GPU, and that will be a custom Radeon Navi chip. So what's special about this is that it'll be powerful enough to support something called ray tracing, which is a technique that models and simulates millions of beams of light bouncing around objects, and this results in very realistic lighting effects, especially where things like reflections are concerned. There are videos out there right now where you can see ray tracing in action, and while games don't look quite like this yet, the potential to get to this point is there with this additional lighting fidelity. Just for context, apparently movie studios use ray tracing to make their computer-generated graphics and effects look so realistic. So imagine what that will look like in games once developers manage to get familiarized with the technology and once hardware catches up to a point where ray tracing can be implemented on a mass level. The technology is currently available on high-end PCs and high-end graphics cards, but consoles haven't seen this until now, so next-gen games will certainly look fantastic. That is, of course, if the effect can be properly taken advantage of. It's not just enough to have the tools, it's a matter of how developers use these tools to produce the most cohesive visual for their games possible. Beyond visual fidelity, the AMD chip will apparently also enhance audio fidelity. Mark Cerny said this on the topic, if you wanted to run tests to see if the player can hear certain audio sources or if the enemies can hear the player's footsteps, ray tracing is useful for that. It's all the same thing as taking a ray through the environment. 
As a gamer, it's been a little bit of a frustration that the audio did not change too much between PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. With the next console, the dream is to show how dramatically different the audio experience can be when we apply significant amounts of hardware horsepower to it. I guess we'll have to wait until PlayStation 5 launches to see how different the audio will be, how much more enhanced it will be, but apparently this extra bit of audio fidelity will be apparent and applied to everything from TV speakers to headphones. Then segueing from 3D audio, Wired asked Mark Cerny about what plans are for PlayStation VR. Mark didn't divulge too many details about what the next hardware for PlayStation VR will be like, but he did confirm that VR is a big part of their future plans, and he did confirm that those who own PSVR currently, that hardware will be supported on PlayStation 5. That's definitely good to hear. PlayStation VR isn't cheap, so it's good to know that there is gonna be the option of using what's currently available or get the next PSVR, whatever it may be called, PSVR 2 probably. In terms of the rumors about the next PSVR hardware, Patton suggests that it will have higher resolution lenses, which is par for the course, and that it will also be wireless, so there's going to be no dongle hanging from your head to the PS4. It's just going to be a, a very liberating experience where you can really move your head around without having to worry about stumbling on wires and such, which is going to be a huge plus, assuming this is true. Next up, the discussion shifted to talk about loading times in games. Mark Cerny conveyed that one of the most requested features for PlayStation 5 among developers was the implementation of solid state drives. Many of you are probably familiar with that technology by now. It's been around for some time. All you have to know is that they're a lot faster than regular hard drives. Windows installed in solid state drives boot up a lot faster, games load faster. It's just a night and day difference if you've used both. And according to Mark Cerny, Sony is basically working on this very specialized solid state drive for PlayStation 5. To demonstrate its capabilities, Mark booted up Insomniac Spider-Man for PS4, and he ran the game on both PS4 Pro and a PlayStation 5 development kit. And one of the things that was tested out was fast traveling and how long it would take the game to load depending on the hardware it's running on. According to Wired, on PlayStation 4 Pro, it took about 15 seconds for Spider-Man to fast travel, whereas on the PlayStation 5 development kit, it took a fraction of that, 0.8 seconds to be exact. Now, obviously we're talking about a current gen game that's running on next gen hardware. So the real test will come when next gen games are released on next gen hardware. That's when we can test out loading times in a more realistic scenario. But still from 15 seconds to 0.8 seconds, that's a huge difference. So I imagine that even with next gen graphics, loading times are overall going to be much faster. Mind you, it will also depend on the developer's ability to optimize their games, you know, games like Anthem, no matter how good your hardware, just had really shitty loading times because the game itself was coded really badly. So that's an important factor to consider. Good hardware doesn't guarantee good loading times, software is a big part of it too. And then on top of faster loading times, the implementation of solid state drives will also allow assets to render faster in real time. Cerny talked a bit about this by discussing the limitations of how fast Spider-Man can move across the world due to the fact that the hardware can render only so many assets at a time. Here's what he had to say on the matter. No matter how powered up you get as Spider-Man, you can never go any faster than this because that's simply how fast we can get the data off off the hard drive. So to demonstrate what he's talking about, he booted Spider-Man for PS4 and moved the game's camera around the city on different hardware. According to Wired's article on the PlayStation 4 Pro, the camera's maximum speed was about how fast Spider-Man could move in the game. But it's a whole different story with the PS5 dev kit. On that hardware, the camera could move as fast as what Wired described as a fighter jet. And while zipping the camera around, Mark would pause the game and then show the environment to demonstrate that everything's rendered and that all the details have been maintained. Going back to the topic of the solid state drive they're making for PS5, this specialized piece of hardware, Mark claims that this has higher raw bandwidth than anything available on the PC, which is a very bold claim and we'll have to wait and see if that really pans out. Worth keeping in mind though is that a big part of what makes PlayStation 5 solid state drive so specialized is that it's being custom made with PS5's overall hardware in mind. 
As Mark put it, quote, the raw read speed is important, but so are the details of the input-output mechanisms and the software stack that we put on top of them. I got a PlayStation 4 Pro and then I put in a solid state drive that cost as much as the PlayStation 4 Pro. It might be one third faster. Wired then added, as opposed to 19 times faster for the next gen console, judging from the fast travel demo. So basically, it's not just about getting the most powerful solid state drive, it's also about how it all works in conjunction with all the different pieces of the PlayStation 5. Moving on, Mark Cerny made a couple of reassurances, like the fact that PlayStation 5 will accept physical media, so it is not going to be this digital box like some people were fearing. Which, you know, thank God. I love physical media. I love physically owning a game. So that is good to hear. Another amazing bit of confirmation is that PlayStation 5 will be backwards compatible with PlayStation 4 games. And this is made possible because PlayStation 5 is in large part based on PlayStation 4 architecture. That's honestly really exciting. I feel like backwards compatibility is such an underrated feature. I love the convenience of being able to connect one piece of hardware and play this huge library of games. This will go doubly true for those who maybe missed out on PS4. They'll have all the more reason to get a PS5 from the get-go, they're gonna have a huge library of games to check out. It was also noted that the similarity of architecture between PS4 and PS5 means that games can be easily released on both consoles. Which probably means we can expect a lot of remasters of PlayStation 4 titles into PlayStation 5, and we can also probably expect a lot of cross-gen releases. Speaking of cross-gen releases, apparently Death Stranding might be among them. When Wired asked about Death Stranding, a spokesperson told them that it will be out on PS4 but wouldn't comment on PlayStation 5. But according to Wired's article, based on Mark Cerny's behavior when the question was asked, it might be possible to interpret that Death Stranding will indeed release on both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. Last but not least, the topic of cloud gaming was brought up, and this is something Mark didn't have many details to share about. Mark Cerny did confirm that Sony does have this vision for cloud gaming, and that what that vision is will become more and more apparent in the future. So yeah, that's pretty much all the information we got from this exclusive Wired article. There's a lot of exciting stuff here in terms of of the hardware upgrades we're gonna see and some of the features we can expect. I'm excited to see what ray tracing will do for games visual fidelity and I am certainly in love with the fact that there is backwards compatibility, that physical media is being retained. But as you all know, the box is nothing without the games, without the software, so that's where the real test lies. I'm not too worried though, Sony does have a really good track record of releasing incredible first party exclusives, and I'm not sure why that would change anytime soon. I will say that PlayStation 4 did take a bit of time to finally get things rolling. The launch titles were pretty weak and it took some time before before we really started getting some incredible first party exclusive releases. So hopefully that's not something that PlayStation 5 will experience. The hope is that the console will kick off running, launch some console selling games right from the get go and keep that ball rolling throughout the entire generation. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Until then, I'd love to hear what your take is on these new PlayStation 5 details in the comments below. With that, I would like to end this news update and discussion video. Thank you for tuning in. To be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews and discussions, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time time. Yong out.